Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm recording on June 2nd, 2023, out in Reykjavik, Iceland. It's 10pm as I record this, and it's still light outside, I can still see a glow coming through my curtains here. Um, the, the days are getting longer, and the nights are getting lighter and uh, what passes for summer in Iceland is is apparently kicking off. Um, But I've had lots of time to play games. I've been playing a couple of interesting ones. I've actually taken a little bit of a break from uh, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which obviously the last two episodes have been about. I think a lot of people actually have been playing it kind of obsessively, overplaying it, you could say, Um, and a little bit of open world fatigue has been setting in for people. I'm still really enjoying the game. Um, I'm now on the last of the the four regional phenomena that are the main quests of the game. Um, But I've slowed down on it an awful lot and decided to play a couple of other things just to freshen myself up. Um, A couple of them didn't stick, a couple of them did, and one I played all the way through to the ending. That's going to be the featured game of this episode, and it is a Game Pass title called Ravenlock. Um, But there is more to talk about in this show. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the puzzle game Humanity that you might have seen. It's very visually striking with a a stream of people that you're guiding through a puzzle environment. I'm going to talk a little bit about After Us. This is another visually striking game, a 3D platformer with environmental themes to it. Um, And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Talos Principle, a game that has been on my two playlist forever. Um, But the trailer for Talos Principle 2 uh, reignited my interest in this one, and I finally opened it up. Um, and played quite a bit of that one too. Um, So I'm going to talk about those three, I'm going to talk about Ravenlock. Uh, But before we get to that, let's run through the games that are coming out this month. It's the start of June, um, and it's a short list this time, so it won't take long, but there are a few things coming out. Um, On the day that I'm recording, June 2nd, Street Fighter VI has come out, um, the beat-em-up from Capcom. This one seems a little different to the previous entries. It has a bit of an open-world brawler um, section to it, from what I understand. Uh, the reviews have been very, very hot on this one. It's a Metacritic 92. Um, I don't really play fighting games, so it's not one for me. Um, but it's nice to see that series chugging along um, and getting its flowers. Um, also out today, there is a re-release of We Love Katamari, uh, re-roll and Royal Reverie. Um, I covered Katamari Damacy on the show ages ago. These are the really wacky, crazy Japanese games where you're a little prince who is pushing an ever-growing sticky ball of objects through a funny little world. And as you roll over things like lollipops and drawing pins and then later desks and uh, cars, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you're pushing this huge ball around and you have to get it to a certain size to pass the level. Um, I haven't played these two games, but I am curious about them. I've got a lot of time for Keita Takahashi's work, um, so I probably will pick that one up at some point. Um, That's out today as well. Um, Out on the 6th and currently in early access for people who pre-ordered it is Diablo 4 from Blizzard. Um, I haven't played the Diablo games. It's another big blot on my gamer card. I am curious. They never seem to go on a very deep sale. Um, But a lot of people really love these games. I hear a lot of kind words about them. This one is a Metacritic of 87, so it's doing very well. Uh, That's out on the 6th for the non-pre-order people. Um, On the 8th comes a game called Mask of the Rose by Fail Better. Um, This is an RPG. It's a, according to the developers, it's a marvellous romance with a hint of murder. Lose your heart to a stolen city in this game of amorous intrigue. Um, This one looks interesting. I actually got this confused with another game um, because I think uh, a game designer that used to be at Fail Better split off and started another studio called Weather Factory, which made Cultist Simulator. Um, And they have a game coming out um, which looks really similar to this one, actually. It looks eerily similar. The key art is this uh, beautiful female protagonist in a dark house, Um, So Mask of the Rose, I got a little confused with the other game that's coming out in August. That other one is called Book of Hours, uh, but Mask of the Rose, it's an RPG style thing. It looks a little bit like an Inkle style game, um, and that one's out on the 8th. Also on the 8th, Harmony, The Fall of Reverie from Don't Nod. This is a really, really pretty looking uh, visual novel with choice based uh, narrative elements to it. It has a hand drawn art style and a really nice color palette. Um, This one, the developers say, you play as Polly, who discovers she has a gift for clairvoyance that connects her to another world. I'm very curious about this one. I've I've liked the look of it since I saw it in a showcase recently, Harmony, The Fall of Reverie. On the 15th, we have Fall of Porcupine. This is a night-in-the-woods-inspired 
Um, I don't know if it's a point and click. Maybe it will be on PC. Maybe it'll have direct control on console. Uh, it's coming to PC and all the consoles. Um, it's described as a story adventure. You play a bird in this one who works in a health service. I played the demo of this a while back and I liked the look of it a lot. Uh, I found the writing a little flat, but that was quite a long time ago now. Um, and I'm certainly curious to see how that one has come on. And one of the highlights of the list this month is a game called Dordon. This is a really interesting looking, quite cute, watercolor styled game that was on a Nintendo Direct recently. Really like the look of this one. It's by a French studio, as you can probably guess from the name. I don't know a huge amount about the gameplay, but it looks like a really cozy good time. Um, and I've always got time for that, especially if it's a short-ish indie game. Um, so I'll be keeping an eye on that one. It's coming to Game Pass on June 13th. Um, there is a big game coming out on the 22nd, Final Fantasy 16, I think it is. Yeah, it's 16 from Square Enix. That one has been getting great reviews. Looks like it's got a refreshed combat system with influence from Devil May Cry, and in fact, some of the former designers of that game, uh, sort of Bayonetta-style fast action combat, which is a bit of a departure. Um, I did quite enjoy the action strategy combat of Final Fantasy VII Remake, um, and this one looks like it's going to be pretty good. All of the previews have been red hot, um, so if you're a Final Fantasy fan, that's something for you to look forward to this month. And the last game on this list is on the 30th. It's Crime O'Clock by Bad Seed. This is a very interesting looking one, actually. It looks a little bit like Toem, if you remember that one, or Chicory, like a top-down, line-drawn, black-and-white game. But this one is um, a crime investigation game, apparently. You investigate cases through time and evolving maps by unveiling a multi-eras linked storyline. That one looks really, really interesting. It's coming out on Switch, and it's coming out on Steam. Um, I like the look of the visuals. I'm intrigued by the premise of that. So rounding out the end of the month on the 30th is Crime O'Clock. And I would like to say a little thank you to the people in the show's Discord for helping me keep this spreadsheet going. There is so much game news coming out all the time. It can be very hard to keep track of it all. Things fall between the cracks. This is a bit of a group effort. We've started keeping this spreadsheet of what's coming out together, um, and I really appreciate it. So thanks to everyone who contributed to that little list. And next, on to what I have been playing. First of all, I played After Us. Um, this one was revealed, I think, at a PlayStation showcase. Oh, I, they all blend together. I don't remember whose showcase it was. Um, but it did catch my eye. It's a very dreamy-looking 3D platformer in which you play as a glowing uh, female figure with a long mane of silver hair who is running through a dark, post-human world, kind of a magical, realist world where um, it looks like a human city, but the cars, for example, are floating up into the air the motorway that you're running across is broken into segments that are just floating in the void and you have to platform your way across them. Um, it has environmental themes, um, which is normally something that I'm quite game for, but in this case, it's super, super heavy-handed. It's like a bit of a, a miserableist take on the direction that humanity is going. Uh, it's like a post-climate, post-industry wrecked world in which you are literally rescuing the spirits of extinct animals. That's the aim of the game here. Um, so you're playing as Gaia. Um, you're running through this world. It's quite nice movement. It has a dash... It has um, a good skating forward momentum run. Um, you can jump, you can double jump. If you hold down jump, you jump higher. And there is also a long jump, so you can run really fast and do these long, improbable jumps. Um, the world itself is pretty linear, but there is a little bit of space for wandering around. There is like black goop everywhere, uh, a little oily, um, polluted black goop that kills you if you get near it. Um, there are lots of deaths that you will have from drops if you don't land jumps. Um, I didn't land jumps quite often in this game. I found it a little hard to judge the jumping distance. Um, and although I do like um, a nice fast moveset in the Solar Ash, Mirror's Edge, the pathless kind of style, um, I thought that's what After Us was going to be. It's not really that. Um, I think that the fluidity of the movement that I was imagining when I saw the trailer for it doesn't quite come together in-game. Um, I found that the moves didn't quite chain together well enough. Um, so I was having a little bit of a frustrating time when I felt like I should really be gliding through the game. Also, there is um, no map or anything like that, but there is a directional system where if you hold down a button, little lights will appear and try and guide you towards your next goal. Except that sometimes they don't. <laughs> sometimes they just kind of hang there and you're not quite sure where to go. Um, I couldn't quite read the environment, so it didn't feel automatic to me to know where I was supposed to go. And I felt like the game was expecting 
that I would just be able to read the world and move through it. So I had a bit of a frustrating time with this one. I played it for an hour or two, and I think that was enough for me. I think I will retire that one. That was After Us. I'm trying to shake myself out of my little uh, little Zelda fatigue. I also tried out another promising looking game called Humanity. This one is from the makers of Res and the Tetris Effect. Um, you might have seen it. It was in a PlayStation showcase. It is on PS Plus, so you can play it for free if you're on one of the higher tiers there. And it's kind of a, a modern take on the Lemmings formula. If you played Lemmings back in the day, that's where lots of little Lemmings drop out of a box into the world. They walk left and right until they hit something, they turn around and walk the other direction. You can make them dig, you can make them climb, you can make them build, all of that kind of thing. Um, and this is a 3D modern Lemmings-like, I would say, in which rather than Lemmings, uh, you get this endless uh, cavalcade, a column of faceless human beings that drop into the level. Um, the levels themselves are like this Apple Store white void with a few little platforms on them. Um, and you have to shepherd the people through these levels. Uh, they are puzzle levels. You can make people turn. You can make people jump. So you can maneuver them around little walkways. If you don't make them turn, they will just walk off the edge and you see this hundreds of people just plummeting out of screen and presumably to their death. Um, you do have a little player character in this one. It's a little white Shiba Inu dog. So it's kind of funny that you're, you're acting like a little sheepdog here and guiding these faceless people through these levels. Um, the puzzles are pretty fun, actually. Um, it's actually really fun and intuitive learning the controls. In this one, you can kind of drop an arrow onto a tile, and then when the, the column of people gets to that tile, if you've dropped a symbol for a jump or a turn, then they will follow your instructions, basically. So you, you're running around ahead of them, trying to scope out the level, trying to drop the commands that you'll need to maneuver the, these people through the level. There are also collectibles you can get along the way and things like that. Um, it is very cool visually, like seeing this, this mass of people just flying through the air and swimming through blocks of water, jumping and marching and climbing. Um, it looks great, and it, it brought a smile to my face, the visual of it. Um, but I did think after, you know, 10 or so levels that if you took away the, the humans, um, the gameplay itself would be pretty simple. It's it could be a game where, like, water is pouring into a level and you just guide the water, if you know what I mean. Like, the fact that it is people is cosmetically interesting. Um, but the gameplay itself, it could be anything, kind of. So this game didn't quite stick with me, um, and I ended up turning away from it early. But I think I'm going to come back to it. I think there's going to be a mood for this game, for humanity, uh, when it might catch me in a slightly different mood and I might stick with it for longer. Um, and after I played Humanity, the last game that I tried out was The Talos Principle. This is a bit of an older game. It came out all the way back in 2015. I've owned it for years. I think I own it on Switch and PlayStation, and I just never got to it. Um, but there was an advert for The Talos Principle 2 in the recent PlayStation showcase, and it, it kind of got my attention. It had this Isaac Asimov kind of feel to it. It had questions about what is life and... Uh, AI, and it had this philosophical edge to it, and a really striking visual look to it too, of these androids walking through another post-human world. Um, so I fired up the Talos Principle uh, playing on PS5, although it's a PS4 version, and, and kind of looks like it. It has edged. Um, Kieran, who was on the show last week, said he thinks it's a Source Engine game, and I can see that. It has got that Half-Life look to it. Um, I only played an hour or so of this one, but I was really transfixed by it in that time. Um, the puzzles were really cool. I like that you are a young AI android's first person, and you've woken up in this strange crumbling garden with um, stone walls everywhere and energy shields blocking them off. Um, and the main puzzle mechanic that I encountered so far is that there are electrical devices scattered around these ruins, which are framed as a test for you, as a nascent AI um, there are energy fields, which you can uh, walk through if you can turn them off using a jammer. There are gun turrets, which will mow you down unless you jam them too. And there are these drones that will gravitate towards you and then explode if you get too close. So you have to use jammers, arrange them, uh, move them, take down one um, enemy threat, and then move the jammer to take down another to open a door to get your collectible and then to go back and open more doors to more puzzles. Um, the puzzles are cool. They're crisply designed. 
Um, you can rattle through them quite quickly in that portal way, like where you're coming through these little puzzle chambers and you're just getting a feel for it. I didn't get stuck. There were a couple of head scratches, but I quite enjoyed them. I felt like all of the tools that I needed were in front of me, did not get frustrated, and I think that's the sign of a good puzzle game. Um, so good early impressions of the Talos Principle, and I will keep playing that one, I think. It would be nice to get through it uh, before Talos Principle 2 comes out. And there are a couple of other games that I have on the slate. I'm planning to play Minabo, A Walk Through Life, a little strange turnipy life simulator. I'm planning to play Mr. Saitu, uh, which is a cute looking little... Uh, I don't know what it is really, like a little narrative life sim kind of thing. And I am also still chipping away at the pixel art adventure game, uh, A Space for the Unbound. So I'm going to keep playing those ones in the background alongside Zelda. I also downloaded a bunch of stuff on Game Pass today that had passed me by in the Zelda period. And I have a bunch of Steam games too, actually. I still want to play the, the Curse of the Golden Idol, or the Case of the Golden Idol, rather. So even though it's a quiet month, there are loads of things to catch up on. And you can expect to hear me talking about those games in the future. And before we get to the main review of the show, let me just say a big thank you to the show's latest patrons. We've had quite a few new patrons recently, so thank you to everyone that has signed up. Uh, the newest patrons are Simon, Wayne, John and Mark, all of whom will get access to eight or nine bonus episodes with more on the way. Um, and the show's Discord, which is a lovely patron-only Discord. It's a quiet little backwater of the internet to talk about games, to share screenshots, to share thoughts and opinions. Um, there was a really big conversation in there about open world design. Um, I really enjoyed that kicked off from Zelda. We talked about what makes a good open world. Uh, what are the things that keep you invested? Um, what are the things that turn you off? It was a really long and interesting conversation. We also play Wordle and Quordle. Uh, we've got the bracket challenge going on where video game characters are set against each other and then we all vote on who goes through. That is really, really fun too. So lots going on in the Discord. You're welcome to become a patron to get those bonus episodes and to come and join us. That is at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild. And it's as little as a dollar a month if you would like to join. And um, all of the money goes back into upgrading equipment to make the show sound better, buying the music that I use on the show, paying for the URL, uh, gaminginthewild.com and all of that stuff. So if you would like to support it, that's great. Thanks to my existing patrons and thanks to you, if that's something you would consider. And with that said, let's move on and talk about the featured game of this episode, Ravenlock. So Ravenlock came out at the tail end of last month. It is by developer and publisher Coco Cucumber, who were previously responsible for Echo Generation, a little pixel art um, action game, I guess, like a Zelda-like in some ways. Um, I played that a little bit of that one. I quite enjoyed it. The game is out on Windows, and it's out on Xbox, and it is on Game Pass, which is where I played it. I played it on my Xbox Series S. Um, it's a completely clean game, not a single bug in the entire playthrough, and only a couple of frame drops too, and there's quite a lot going on on screen in this game visually. Um, I thought it performed very well. Um, I was actually planning to skip it though, this one didn't review incredibly well, um, but I heard Adam talking about it here, my friend Adam, who runs the Beat Your Backlog podcast, which I recommend. I will put a link to his uh, review of this game in the show notes. Um, it was quite positive and encouraged me to give this one a try. And I think for the purposes of like a little palette cleanser, if you are neck deep in Zelda and feel like changing it up a little bit, Ravenlock is a pretty good game for that. Um, it has a meta score of 68. How Long to Beat says that it takes 3.5 hours. I think I came in around three, um, but I was speed reading a lot of the text. Um, and the developers say about this one, embark on an enchanting journey in Ravenlock, an action-packed fairy tale adventure about a young heroine destined to fulfill a perilous prophecy. And I have to say of this one that it's a short, charming adventure in which we enter a fairy tale kingdom through a magic mirror and take up a quest to liberate the realm from an evil queen. It's a simple comfort food video game with plenty of heart and some colorful, fantastical visuals. Um, and it is a very simple game, this one. Um, I've been thinking about this one because it's, in many ways, unremarkable, but at the same time, I had a really nice time going through this game. Um, it was very easy to just smash pots and kill enemies and follow the trail of the story, even though um, it's a very low-key kind of game. Like, it doesn't do anything we haven't seen before, not a single thing. 
but what it does, it does well. Um, and I found it like a, an easy, comforting play and a perfect palate cleanser in my Zelda playthrough. Um, the game starts when you, as a heroine that you get to name, um, is moving into a country house, an old country farmhouse that the family has inherited from a grandma who has apparently passed away. And so you start the game helping out your dad. You have to get into the swing of the fetch quests that you're going to be doing an awful lot of, go and find the toolkit from the van, uh, set the table for your mother, and then you're sent into the barn to just look for something, and you find a dusty old mirror there, which you have to do another fetch quest to go and find a cloth to clean it. Uh, but before you know it, you've been sucked into the mirror and to a magical realm. It's got a very Alice in Wonderland kind of vibe to it. One minute you're in a, a normal kind of color palette, um, on a driveway with your parents, just looking at the uh, the vegetable patch and imagining the kind of things that you might grow there and do there. And the next minute you are sucked through the mirror and you come out of a giant flower in a beautiful, beautiful environment um, with a little talking rabbit guy who welcomes you. He says that your name is Ravenlock and that you have finally arrived to fulfill the prophecy. And as we've all done so many times before, the first order of business is to go and find a sword and shield. You get a little tutorial about how to fight. You can wander around the locale and see the entrance to a forest. You can see another direction, a, a big pink castle in the distance, a spectacular castle. And your quest has begun. Um, I really liked the, the familiar but different take on the Alice in Wonderland vibe. Like you are straight away greeted by these talking rabbits. Uh, You'll meet the Mad Hatter, you'll meet Tweedledum and Tweedledee, the Cheshire Cat, and of course, the evil queen at the heart of it all. And um, there's lots of card suit imagery, lots of diamonds, clubs, hearts, spades, uh, lots of top hats and oversized animals. Um, and it has a really, really strong fairy tale vibe that I really like here. Um, and what is going on in this kingdom is that the evil queen has been imprisoning all the animals and just being an evil queen. Um, her palace gate is locked and it needs three pieces slotted into it to get in there and deal with her. These belong to bosses that you'll find scattered in the corners of this realm. And off you go. You have to go through a garden, you have to go through a forest, a beautiful greenhouse, a theatre, a laboratory, a maze, a museum. And all of the environments are very, very cool to see. I was genuinely looking forward to every new area that I would go to. And I would say that in large part, that is down to the visuals. The visuals are what carries this game to some degree. The visual style is something that I haven't really seen before, actually. Your character is a polygonal model um, and kind of smooths out as, as such. It looks like a sim kind of thing. Um, but a lot of this world is made out of voxels, little cubes. 3D cubes, and so you get this really interesting mixture of uh, polygonal shapes and blocky voxels, and somehow it works incredibly well. Um, I really like voxel art, I really liked the visuals of The Tourist, if you remember that game, a really beautiful advanced voxel game, um, and I really loved the mashup here. It really, really works somehow. Um, it makes the world feel alive and 3D as you're running through it. Um, and the colour palette is really incredible. It's intense, bright, colourful. It is eye-popping and kind of spectacular. Every screen is packed with detail. There are plants in the foreground. There are glowing toadstools. There are cracked pillars and stone tablets. Everywhere you look, there are pots to break that give you money. Very, very satisfying and basic collectathon gameplay. Um, there are pathways going into the distance and trees hanging into the frame. Uh, light is used very well. The first area that you explore is a deep, gloomy forest with glowing vines. And I really liked how the atmosphere of the space is changed up throughout the game, from the bright square and the Victorian house where you begin, to that gloomy forest, to the dark, dusty, dank old theatre, to the castle itself, which has these gleaming pink spires that look very, very tempting, looking at you from behind the high wall that you're trying to get through. I would say that it has a, an atmosphere of something like The NeverEnding Story, or Labyrinth, or The Princess Bride. It has this 1980s fantasy classic feel to it. I think that sensibility is certainly present here. Um, it's present in all of the visual design and the spirit of the whole thing. Um, and it's a really wonderful style. It's very coherent. It's um, crazily detailed. It's a feast for the eyes, really. Um, the camera is interesting in this game. It plays pretty much like a 2.5D game. Sometimes you're running from left to right and right to left. Sometimes you're running into the screen. Sometimes you're exploring a little open plane with an isometric style camera where the camera might flip upwards and be looking down at you as you walk through like a grass maze or something like that. Um, 
I really like having camera control, and you get a little bit of it in this game. You can tweak the camera left and right just to, to look at a wall or something like that, and sometimes you have to. Um, but I wasn't mad at the camera in this one. I think it, it did the job well, and it is a 2.5D game, so there is like some walking in and out of the screen and left to right, and it kind of works. It hangs together really well, I thought. Um, and a lot of what you're doing in this game is simple quests. Um, it's a really simple me and potatoes kind of game where you'll meet someone who needs something, you go and get the thing, maybe you get it right away, maybe you have to fight some things to get it, maybe it's in a different area and you have to come back and complete that quest later, but everything is pretty simple, it's like a key for a lock, it's like a poison for a nasty plant, that kind of thing. It's pretty well organised, you will get a little quest marker, you have a little journal you can see in the, the pause screen where you can also do things like putting on a hat if you find one, or looking at how many potions you have, looking at your inventory. Um, and I think that it's it's quite clear. Everything is really clear in this game in a way that I really enjoyed. Um, if you are doing a quest that needs you to punch in some combination on certain buttons, and then go and talk to a person, and then go back and open a door, then the steps of the quest will appear in your quest log. So it's really hard to get lost in this game in a way that I really appreciated. Um, I did get stuck once or twice, um, but it was only because of not seeing an interactable thing in the busy visual environment. Like, I didn't notice a clock that I was supposed to wind and became very confused and was just running around a little bit. Ended up looking at a video on YouTube and was like, oh, it's just wind the clock. I was looking everywhere four o'clock. I just didn't read it in the environment. That only happened once or twice. On the whole, it's very manageable. It's pitched at a pretty low level. I would say this is a kind of game that is suitable for kids. Um, and if you are a somewhat brain-dead um, Zelda player like myself who is just looking for an easy good time, um, it was good for me too. The other thing that you're going to spend most of your time doing is combat. There are wandering enemies that you'll find just walking around the world. There are monster ambushes where you have to beat a couple of waves of enemies who will surprise you. And sometimes quite a lot of them, but they are incredibly easy to take down, so it's never that stressful. Um, in, a, in a way that I really enjoyed, actually. Um, you get a single spammy sword attack that you can just hammer the button and hack away at stuff. No combos or anything interesting like that, just a single sword strike that you can do very rapidly. Um, you do have a shield. If you hit the top button, you will hold up your shield. There is a little endurance meter attached to that that goes down when you take a big blow, um, but I never really felt like I had to use it. Um, you also get special attacks throughout the game as rewards for beating bosses and things like that. Um, there are four different ones. There's like a flurry attack, a dash attack, a fire attack, things like that. Um, they're useful, they do more damage, um, they're on a cooldown. So in a boss fight, you can use them kind of interchangeably. Um, I never found that I was using them strategically, exactly. I just kind of used one when it was available. Um, I never used them to kind of get out of trouble or to, you know, address a certain situation. I just spammed them when they were available. You can also use items in combat. If you press down on the D-pad, the game pauses for you to look at your little item menu. You have healing potions, small, medium or large. You have bombs of various types, ice bombs, fire bombs, poison bombs. They are elemental in, in name and uh, visually, but I don't really think there is an elemental system here, so I think that's just uh, window dressing, really. It's honestly just very, very simple combat. You just batter things and they die. Uh, monsters telegraph their moves very clearly um, before they swing at you, and once they have entered the animation, they freeze in place and tend not to track you. So you can literally just walk behind them, they will swing into the air, and you can spam your attacks until they die. Um, you do get mobbed sometimes, but you can hit multiple enemies at once, and you can break their attack animations by striking them often. Um, so getting mobbed was actually quite fun. Um, and you have so many healing potions. Money is kind of endless in this game. You can always buy more. So getting hit doesn't really matter. Um, and while in a way there was like a game a part of me that sort of smirked at the combat design here, there is another part of my game of soul that just really, really enjoyed it. It's like the literal opposite of Elden Ring, which is, you know, like a stressful grind. Um, this is absolutely stress-free, completely easy combat with very predictable enemies that are easy to avoid. Your reward for killing enemies is one of the two currencies of the game. You get feathers 
which you can take to a little guy who is outside of a witch's house, and he will power you up. Powering up is very simple. It means that you just do more damage, I believe, um, which is helpful. It means that early game enemies you end up being able to take out with one or two hits. So after a boss fight, I would fast travel back to the witch's house and power up a couple times. There is also endless gold. Um, there are pots scattered throughout this world, a little bit like in Zelda. It's just really fun smashing them. The collectathon nature of collecting money just made the moment to moment like engaging enough for me. I smashed every pot that I saw in this game. I just can't leave them alone. So again, it was the game of brain was just engaged. I was like, yep, I'm going to smash every pot. I'm going to kill every enemy. I'm going to stockpile all of these materials and just glide through the game, having a simple good time. Um, if you leave an area, enemies and money will both respawn instantly. So if you walk out of a room and then back into it, all of the pots will be there again. So you could farm money easily, but there is literally just so much of it scattered throughout the realm. Um, I think the game wants you to have more than enough money to buy healing potions and bombs and just have an, an easy good time. And that's something that I appreciate. Um, one of the highlights of the game is bosses. I think there were 10 or 15 bosses. There were quite a few mini bosses. There are three story bosses. There are the final confrontation, of course. Um, these were actually really fun. There's like a little animation where you have a conversation with like, you know, like a giant dragon or whatever, some fairy tale boss. Um, they will then flip into attack mode. Um, it was kind of fun seeing them. They're usually quite big. There was a sense of spectacle to them, even if their AI was about the same as the field enemies. Um, it's very easy to see their attacks coming. You can literally walk around them while they swing into nothing, locked in their animations, and hit them from behind. Um, but there were a couple that had like a fire attack or an area attack, so you had to dash away, or a poison attack that you had to get away from them so that you didn't get poisoned, that kind of thing. Um, I really enjoyed them. There wasn't really much sense of peril or danger. I think I died three times in this game, and I feel a little ashamed about that. I feel like I should have gotten through this game without dying. It was literally just because at some points... Um, I had so many healing potions and was quite powered up and I felt like I could just take hits and still win. So I was just standing there taking hits, not blocking, not being strategic and just carelessly died a couple of times. Um, but I sailed through most of the game very easily. If you play this one, try and get through it without dying. See if you can do it. I think that you probably could. Something else that I really enjoyed about this game was that when you come into a new area, you can see in the distance that there's a character that you're clearly supposed to talk to. For example, a big golden chicken sitting in a bandstand. Um, but me being me, I would do everything else first. So I would wander around the entire new area that I was in, exploring all the nooks and crannies, breaking all of the pots, and probably finding a bunch of shit while I was doing it. Like, you might find a pickup, like a feather, and you'll be like, okay, that's probably for that chicken. And by the time you've done your little round of the area, you go and finally talk to the chicken. It's like, oh no, I've lost my five feathers. Can you please help me? Help me? And then you just um, cycle the dialogue and then immediately click and talk to them. And he's like, oh, you brought me my five feathers. Thank you very much. So it was like a fun, like self-made mini game to try and complete quests before they were given so that you could just cycle the dialogue and get the quest quickly. Um, there are lots of nice nooks and crannies in, in the areas. There's lots of stuff to look at. And the fact that it is so pretty um, really drew me in and made me want to look in the corners just to just to take it all in, really. Um, I can't stress enough just how good this game looks. So to run through a few of the good and bad things about this one, um, good, absolutely the visuals. They, they carry the game. Um, they drew me in. They made me want to look at every area. They made me excited to go to every new area. Um, there was real variety between the different places that you will go. Um, some places are dark, dank, claustrophobic. Others are open and expansive and bright and almost Mario uh, Mushroom Kingdom-like in nature. Others were like dark little dungeons. Um, I really liked flipping between all of these areas. Um, I loved walking into a new area and seeing new characters to talk to. Um, I like that in each area there are mini quests and side quests that you can do. Um, for example, in the first area, you can wake up these statues that light up the forest. And you just get a little bonus. Huh? You just get a potion or something. So it's not like a major reward or anything. Um, but it was another excuse to do a lap of the forest, just breaking pots and lighting up the woods. Um, the colour palette is amazing. I love the way that light is used. Um, the variety and the art design um, and the whole look of the game is just a huge success. It really does carry the game along. Um, I would say that gameplay-wise, all the basics here are present and correct. 
Um, nothing spectacular, but all of the basics work fine. You know, the combat is fine. Um, fast travel is a really good inclusion. You will find mirrors dotted around the kingdom that you can zip between different places when you have to go back somewhere. Um, the quest log was very, very clear. I really appreciate that. All of these small decisions made for a very smooth experience. Um, the same with the menus and the UI. Um, it's seamless and effortless to use um, through its simplicity. And I actually think that that kind of design um, is more complicated than it looks. Like knowing what to do, knowing what not to do, um, knowing what the player might need to get through the game and giving it to them. Um, I really appreciate that. You know, even some big games like God of War Ragnarok um, had an awful menu and an absolutely incomprehensible UI. Um, so a simple game like this, doing things simply, I really appreciate it. Um, same with the run speed. You can move through this world really quickly. Um, there is a little dash that you can do, just a short dash. Um, it's one of those games where the dash is not connected to endurance, another quality of life consideration, but it did mean that I spent most of the game just uh, hammering the dash button as I ran just to get around it very quickly. Um, it's the kind of game where you can slip into autopilot um, in a way that I enjoyed, actually. You just get through it, and it's um, there's not much resistance, and it looks great. So it was just fun dashing around this world, getting it done. Um, I did like that there were new combat abilities that were introduced regularly, even if they weren't strategically useful. Um, they were just fun to have, like the flurry blow, um, the series of hard strikes with a smash at the end. It's just fun to have new moves as you're moving through it. It makes you feel like you're growing stronger, and that's a nice feeling to have in the game. Um, there were cute little characters everywhere. There were little rabbits like sticking out of leaves, sticking out of bushes. Some of them have dialogue for you. Some of them just say meep, meep. There's just an awful lot of character and um, lots of cute things to talk to to keep you engaged. Um, overall, this is a very simple game, almost simplistic game, I would say. It's the kind of a good game to switch your brain off um, and just play in a single sitting or in two. I played it in two. I should have just finished it, really. I think I only had half an hour left on it. Uh, it might have been more satisfying just to play the whole thing in a single go. Um, smashing pots, getting gold, doing mini quests, speeding bosses, and just having a good time without having to think about it too hard. It passes very quickly and very smoothly. Um, there's no time to get bored with it, even though it is so simple, and it always looks good. It was just a pleasure, really. I would put this one on the same tier as games that I've coded in the past, like um, Lost in Random, which was like, you know, janky and serviceable and fun in its own way. Uh, the Gunk, that was a really another really good, simple video game. Uh, Beasts of Maravilla Island, Lost Words, Wavetail. These kind of C-tier games almost. They are competent, manageable, diverting little video games in which you are doing video game things. Um, it's a comfort food game in that way. Um, and there is a place in my heart for these kind of games. You know, they're the good kind of 6 out of 10. Um, it's not perfect, though. As for the bad things, simplicity cuts both ways. Um, it's not refined. Um, there is no finesse in anything beyond the visuals. Um, everything is incredibly familiar. Um, I would say that it's simple to the point of being basic. Um, but that wasn't a bad thing for me. That's kind of what I liked about it. Um, the combat was also very simplistic. I think that anyone who enjoys game combat, anyone who plays more difficult or challenging games will find this rudimentary to the point of being perhaps insulting, um, but just spamming attacks and walking behind enemies to kill them was satisfying to me. Um, I liked this easy ass video game. Uh, money was plentiful to the point of being pointless, like you should be just given things in the store. I never ran out of money a single time. Um, you're smashing pots everywhere you go, um, so you're always just loaded. Um, the game intends itself to be easy. Um, it's really unchallenging. I can't uh, underscore that enough, so please don't expect any challenge or even resistance from this game, I would say. Um, you do have to be comfortable with fetch quests to enjoy this one. There was a lot of um, near style, go and get this thing for me, you run somewhere, you get it, you go back. It's better than near here though. Uh, near Replicant had the worst fetch quests in the world. Um, but the, the fast travel and the proximity of the things that you are looking for to the quest giver is all very easy breezy in this one. Um, I would say that a couple of times I lost my way a little bit in puzzles just because of not being able to see the thing I was supposed to use. 
So it is such a busy visual environment that I think twice I just didn't notice that something was interactable and it wasn't in my way, so I didn't see the, the button prompt as I was walking past it. Um, but none of the puzzles were complicated. It was just a readability issue. Um, I would say that the music goes into the bad things in this review. It's it's unspectacular, unmemorable. I've just finished playing the game and I can barely remember a note of it, to be honest. Um, music could have really lifted this one, I think. It is a fairy tale world. And a little bit of that uh, Danny Elfman style sparkle uh, could have really lifted this game. I do think that if you think of games like Lost in Random and Wavetail, um, where they were weak in gameplay, they were strong in presentation, the art style, the memorable music. Um, and that's kind of what makes them work. Same with the gunk, really. All of those games that are below average gameplay-wise, but above average presentation-wise, that can be enough to carry you through. Um, I would have appreciated better music in this game. But to conclude, it's just a, a really cute, cuddly little comfort food game. You know, this is uh, the burger and fries of video games. Um, you will eat many of them in your life, and they may all pretty much blur together. You know, it's like just a bodega burger and fries and Coke. And I have to say, for the, the moment that I'm in right now, where I'm a little overwhelmed and a tiny bit burned out on playing too much Zelda, which is entirely my own fault, I must add. Uh, Ravenlock really hit the spot. Um, I enjoyed this one. It was uh, playable enough and pleasant enough for me to just waft through it and come out feeling good at the end of it. Um, so if you are in a similar position to me, if you're a little burned out on Zelda and you want something to divert your attention, and if you happen to have Game Pass, then you can, of course, play it as part of your subscription, then this could be just the ticket. It was for me. That's Ravenlock. So that was Ravenlock. That was a really fun little game. Perfect Game Pass game. I love a short, uh, snappy, charming indie game on Game Pass that you can just get through quickly. It was nice to finish a game after Zelda has blown a hole in my schedule and my cadence. I feel like I'm normally playing like one or two games, maybe three, um, and I have a couple in my back pocket and I kind of know what's coming up. It's very useful for me to manage my time that way for doing the podcast, to always have something to talk about. Um, Zelda has just blown a hole in that, you know. Uh, for the last two, three weeks, it's been um, all that i played, really. Um, and so I don't have a cadence at the moment, so a nice little indie game like this just dropping into my lap was perfect. Uh, not sure what the next week's show will be about. Maybe Minabo, A Walk Through Life? Maybe Mr. Sai 2? Or maybe Adam will be back from Japan and we will get to have our chat about where we are up to in Tears of the Kingdom. I'm on the final regional phenomenon now, so I'm kind of getting close to a place that feels like I could go to Endgame if I wanted to in Zelda. Not quite sure that I want to, um, but it would be really fun to talk to Adam about it and to talk about the Goron dungeon and to talk about the Gerudo and Zora areas of the map. So I will try and get that set up as well. Um, but I will be back next week with another episode. I'd love to hear from you. What are you playing? Are you still neck deep in Zelda? Have you had to take a little time away from it? Have any indie games snuck out in the interim that should have gotten more attention? Come and let me know. I'm on Twitter as Gaming in the Wild and also Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and elsewhere. You're also welcome, of course, to become a patron, support this podcast and to come and join that really pleasant Discord community. You can do so at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild. Um, thanks very much for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode. Take care of yourselves and each other and bye-bye for now.